screen. There we go. Oh, and I'll share, yeah, and I'll share screen. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Share Post screen. disabled participant sh screen sharing. Yeah, Partici I'm just doing that. Okay. Should I try again? Oh, it didn't work? Well, I don't know. It didn't work the first time. This time it works, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yay. Thank you. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. So I'll try it this way. Uh, well, thanks to people present. Um, I think it, it's, uh, it is a good idea to send out a reminder just because we forget. And, and actually, I can never find the link. I don't know how I managed to lose it, but I do. Okay, I'll, re I'll do it. I'll send it out next time. So um, most of these slides are were shown to a year a year or two ago. I don't think that matters. I did put some new ones in. And in my own processing of this story, there was I noticed a shift and I think uh, it, you know there's a there's a Wednesday night program where people come. There's about 10 people who come and <clears throat> and I showed a video of by Ed Young, Y-O-N-G. And some of you will certainly recognize his name and others maybe not, but he has this book out called uh, An Immense World. And actually, I tried to read the book and I, I couldn't get into it. There was a little too much information about the mantis shrimp in the first chapter. So the but the video is a little more is a little more easy, more accessible. The point is that there are all these species of life on the planet and uh, each one has its own way of perceiving the world but they do perceive the world, they are sentient beings. That I think would be one of his main points. And I'm, I'm very touched by the fact that, I mean, it's not completely news, but it's interesting. It's an area I think of growth for awareness and consciousness that, that we share the planet with all these living organisms and they all have their own lives and they are always fascinating. Uh, sometimes we might be required to eat them because <laughs> everything eats everything else. Anyhow, I'm touched and uh, a term came to mind. I put a few more slides like this. So this is a kind of a personal experience I had. This was in here previously, but there are a couple of new ones of wildlife that I've interacted with. And I'll tell you this story about the, these are coyotes, pups. But the interacting with wildlife, I think illustrates the fact of how connected we are, how much we care about other life forms. And the term, which is probably E.O. Wilson, the famous uh, biologist, naturalist, E.O. Wilson, probably he coined the term biophilia. Biophilia means love of life. And I realized that that's what I was actually interacting with, that this feeling of love would arise for the species on the planet and at best for the whole larger biosphere. <laughs> Well, you can't help but love these little creatures. So these are, I forget, I, I got a sense, probably a month old coyote pups. This was an experience I had about 10 years ago. I was walking up a side canyon with Annika Mines in Pipestone Canyon. Annika grabbed my arm, said, Dana. And I thought it was probably a rattlesnake because Pipestone is famous for rattlesnakes. And she had seen up the hill these two pups were coming out of their den. Actually, we had seen just a, a minute before an adult coyote just racing up a steep hill nearby. And I guess the mother was leaving. I don't know why she did that. <clears throat> but, and then we didn't know there was a den there until these very young coyote pups showed up and were so charming. So then we had the, uh, the continuing experience. Seven of them came out. I think I have a picture in here of seven of them and they saw they were looking at us and I think it was the first time they had come out of that den and they didn't know what we were and so they decided to find out and all seven of them ran down the hill through the bush sometimes I could see them and sometimes I couldn't and right up to our feet <laughs> I wondered if we were going to be attacked and then they sort of yelped and turned around and ran back and went back in the den it was but it was a, a totally rich lovable experience and all any wildlife experience has that quality. 
So you can't read this. I thought about taking it out because you most of you probably can't read it, but uh, I showed it before the evolutionary characteristics of the plants. I left it in because it shows that there's something going on. There's some some directionality there. And I put that red line in to show that something's going on. And what's going on in general terms is an ad, is adaptation of life to dry land because life evolved in water. And to live without water was an evolutionary process and, and a challenge for life. It took millions of years for life to move on to land. So these these are adaptations. It just shows that there are adaptations. You might not be able to see what they are. Maybe you can. One of the first ones I can see them, the cuticle, which is a waxy layer on the surface of the plant, which keeps it from just randomly losing its moisture. A vascular system comes after cuticle. So there's there's blank spaces. The first plants, mosses and liverworts don't have a vascular system. They can't grow straight up in the air. Redwood trees have vascular systems and grow almost 400 feet tall. How is that possible? that they are able to raise water 400 feet to serve the, the biological processes up that high. Well, they have vascular systems and we talked a little bit about how they do it, not completely. Pollen, it's just, so pollen, early life forms, if they're gonna reproduce sexually, one gamete usually swims through water to a second gamete. Well, how is a land plant gonna manage that? So they developed ways of reproducing on land and one is pollen. And then of course, once there was pollen and wind pollination, this symbiotic relationship arose where insects carried it. It's much more, infinitely more trustworthy than wind pollination. They both work, but it's apparently insect pollination works better. So this is a similar graph. You also can't probably read it. It's just to show that there's something going on in the evolution of, of animals. There's change over time, and a lot of that change is adaptation to living on land. We start with fish. It's not the first animal, but it's first on this chart. Amphibians, the word amphibian means two lives. They, as most amphibians live as their the eggs are laid in water. They, they have to be in water. The larva forms in water, and the adults come out and actually develop gills magically. I mean, excuse me, lungs. They start out with gills, metamorphose into lungs, and they adapt to life on land. Reptiles take another step and birds and mammals. So it's just that the evolution has some direction to it. You also can't read this, I apologize, but this is a stratigraphy of the Metha Valley and what you can read are the things that I inserted. So the bottom is the twist formation, which we talked about a few weeks ago. It's the, I'd say it's the oldest sedimentary formation in the Metha, it's down there on the bottom. It's 160 million years old. What I find interesting is correlating this with the evolution of life on the Metha, on the planet, and that the geology of the Methow can be correlated with the evolution of life. So the twist formation is correlated with the age of reptiles. There were mammals, but they were little tree shrews, tiny little creatures. The first flowering plants appeared at the same time the Buck Mountain formation was laid down. There are a lot of fossils in the Buck Mountain formation, but I don't know of any flowering plants. Dinosaurs go extinct. That's up at the Midnight Peak formation 100 million years ago. Well, that was 65 million years ago. Uh, it's just that um, the history of the planet is reiterated in the stratigraphy of the Methow, at least back 160 million years. So I've mentioned big history. Big history is really just evolution. Or it's evolution. It's a, it's a college and high school uh, curricula. Um, it's taught, at, a big history class is taught at the Methow Valley High School um and it's taught in colleges it's and it's really just evolution but it's it picks out some points of evolution that's evolution is not random there's something going on and one thing that's going on that would be very hard to you could not argue with it is increasing complexity over time there were no planets there, there were no stars there were no planets there was no life there was only hydrogen and helium <laughs> everything that exists has appeared over time that's increasing complexity there are these mysterious goldilocks conditions so this is considered a theme in big history. I don't think, you know, evolution doesn't really consider Goldilocks conditions, but things are are strangely just right for life. I had uh, a geologist in the class on Wednesday take issue with that. And he made the point that life actually adapts to the conditions as they are. It's not that the conditions adapt to life. It goes both ways. And my favorite example of the Goldilocks condition would be the 
small planet that ran that smashed into the earth early in the history of the earth so billions of years ago and tilted it over to 23 degrees it was a what would look like a disaster at the time but if that hadn't happened the earth would not be tilted at 23 degrees that means there would be no seasons every day would be like just every other day uh there the distribution of heat because the earth tilts back and forth over the year rotation around the sun uh, it would be it would be much harder much hotter at the equator and much colder at the poles because it would be you wouldn't have the distribution of heat there are other effects the uh, the, uh, the earth remelted when it was hit by that planet well, more iron went to the core it helped create the magnetic the uh, the rotating metal we have in the outer core that creates a magnetic field that blocks some solar some cosmic radiation which is high energy radiation high energy radiation which is damaging to living cells well that was very lucky that that planetesimal smashed into the earth 4.5 billion years ago that is a goldilocks effect things emerge that's like increasing complexity everything that exists now did not exist for, formerly everything has emerged over time uh, all this life emerged we don't know how life emerged it appears life emerged only once on the planet and now there are we don't know two million species or more and actually i take comfort in that word because you know humanity is challenged right now to build a sustainable society well i think humanity has the potential to continue to um portray emergence to experience the emergence of increasing i would say ecological literacy instead of saying intelligence i would say ecological literacy that we understand we live in an ecological context and we are ecological beings that would be a new emergent step and this is again a, a fourth theme theme with big history and that is thresholds and that is the idea that sometimes things emerge quite quickly like stars ignite probably in a few seconds once there's enough hydrogen there were no stars now there's uncountable billions of stars they all ignited it's from gravity smashing hydrogen atoms so close together that they start releasing energy it probably happens in a few seconds it's an emergent phenomenon and one can find other examples of that this is a geologic time scale so these are things <clears throat> these things this is the last thing you won't be able to read but I'm just showing that for one, it exists. And this shows some of the, the evolution of life coordinated with geologic history, the two columns on the right. But I put in a few things here to relate it to, just a couple things to relate to the Methow. So 65 million years ago, at approximate that level on that geologic time scale, we have fossils, we have 65 million year old fossils in Pipestone Canyon of Dawn Redwoods. Don Redwoods were thought to be only a fossil until they were found in the early 1940s alive in China. And now they grow, I know, at the University of Washington and elsewhere in Seattle. They won't grow in the Methow too cold. Well, they're, they're a semi-tropical plant, but they grew in the Methow 65 million years ago. That's how much things change over time, a lot. Things change a lot over time. And I put this up as a, a little brain twister for you. 6,000 years before the present, salmon appear in the Columbia in large numbers. Well, that seems to be an established fact that prior to that, for we'll say the 6,000 years before that, there were not large numbers of salmon in the Columbia. Well, why not? Well, you may or may not be able to figure out the answer to that, but the answer is the ice age. There was so much sediment in the rivers, and a lot of the rivers were covered with ice. The Columbia wasn't, but uh, it was not decent habitat for salmon at that time. <clears throat> so all of these things, it's another change. There were probably salmon before the previous glacial advance <clears throat> in the 50,000 years be between glacial advances, but they come and go. Things change over time. <clears throat> I thought about taking this out. It looks a little complicated, but it's actually quite basic. <clears throat> and it's, it's biological insight into the nature of life. <clears throat> and the evolutionary nature of life. Last week, I put up uh, the tree of life, which shows the six phyla, like plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, archaea, and protists. <clears throat> they divide those into three domains, the biologist, the taxonomist, 
divide that into three domains. Two of them have that cell that we talked about last week, prokaryotes. The word is down there in the lower left. They have no nucleus and they're microscopic. Bacteria, <clears throat> you probably have to get to, I forget the actual number, at least 100 uh, magnification before you can see. Probably higher than that, probably. I've seen them in my microscope and I think I'm up there around 600 before I see either bacteria or archaea. Those are two domains of life. Archaea is so different from bacteria, they put them in their own domain. We have a different kind of cell, a eukaryotic cell. The word actually means the true cell, a little human hubris there, because we create all these names. They have uh, nuclei and they're 100 times larger than bacteria cells. So how did all this diversity, life start, life appeared once on the planet, Three point eight billion years ago, the planet was already almost a billion years old. That's interesting. Went <laughs> for a billion years with no life. Must have been pretty quiet. <clears throat> and life appeared. It, it seems to all life is chemically related. You can see the relationship. All life has DNA, or I think, or some, some may have RNA. You know, a related. Uh, genetic material. And actually you can transfer DNA from one organism to another and sometimes it'll be incorporated into that organism. Bacteria do that all the time. How did this diversity, one, one life form and now two million life forms, how did this diversity appear over time? A partial answer at least is natural selection and it's, it's enumerated down there at the bottom that parents have more offspring than, they, than can survive. I think I mentioned the the uh, extreme example is the ocean sunfish lays 3 million eggs at one time. How many of those eggs have to survive to replace the parents? Two. If, the, if, if more than that didn't die over time, the world would fill up with sunfish. But 2,999,998 on average die. Well, which ones are going to live? The ones that on average. All else being equal, there is some ra randomness to this, but all else being equal, the ones best adapted to the environment are the ones that are going to survive. And so this, and it's each each generation varies a little bit because because of uh, independent assortment. That's a, geo a a genetic term, but there is independent assortment of chromosomes. So each generation is a little different than the previous generation. This is a classic example from the Annals of Biology. It's the English pepper and moth. English pepper and moth in the early 1800s were mostly white. There were a few black ones. They tended to land on tree bark, especially this birch, white birch. When a white one lands on white birch, it becomes invisible. So there is a white peppered moth in this picture. This is the body. If you can see my cursor, this is a wing. Well, you can't see it. It's invisible because it's, it's white on white. So when a predator comes, it's going to eat the black one. So this is natural selection, picking out the black ones. They, they were not adapted to the environment as it existed at that time. So there'd be one black one for every thousand moths. It was just a genetic variation that survived, but didn't survive very well. Well, after the Industrial Revolution, there was so much soot in the air that the bark of these trees turned black or blackish. And then the white moth became visible and the black one became less visible and predators started picking off the white one and and the number of white moths compared to black diminished over time and black became dominant that's how natural selection works actually it has shifted back because they put scrubbers in their smokestacks and there's not as much soot in the air in england and now the english pepper moths are white again i just couldn't re i put this picture in here before i just can't get over diatoms they are protus so that is one of the kingdoms of life. They're eukaryotes. That's one of the domains of life. Uh, but they're they're just major players. And who would think that diatoms, which we've mostly never even seen and hardly know exist, create up to 25%. Actually, I've seen higher numbers than that. Up to 25% of the oxygen in the atmosphere or more. And they didn't always exist. They have increased in the ocean dramatically in the last 30 million years. And they are primary producers. They're photosynthetic. They create food out of sunlight and carbon dioxide. It's a magic trick. So this has changed over time. They have made the oceans far more fecund because 
there's more food. That means you can start to build a food chain on this food source. And indeed that's happened. And I made the claim that that's where baleen whales come from because baleen whales are filter feeders. They eat plankton. I'm sure they eat diatoms, but they eat this, they eat the primary consumers more, which are somewhat larger, the, the consumers that are eating the diatoms. This has changed over time. This is the evolutionary story. We don't have very many baleen whales in the Medhow, but it's just such a great story. And that's a little joke in case you're wondering what I mean. So all of this, we, the beauty of humanity, in spite of our failings, is we have had to discover everything we know about the planet we live on. There's more to learn, primarily learning how to live ecologically, which is next week's program. I'm not going to preach next week. I don't know what I'm going to do with that program, but but ecological, mm, ecological reality is a powerful force. And uh, for some reason, it doesn't sink in very <laughs> easily to human perception. We're not very aware that we live in an ecological context. Anyhow, my point with this slide is we had to learn everything we know about the world we had to learn. We didn't know about photosynthesis. We didn't know how trees grow. We didn't know that there was a microcosm and that's what this is about. This fellow, uh, Anton von uh, Leunach, Ed Young, um, in a video, he uh, apologizes when he pronounces that name because none of us know how to speak Dutch. So he was one of the first people to make uh, lenses that magnified uh, any object that was placed under them. And he did a great job of it. He started to see that that many places in on the wa in the planet especially water was full of life forms that we had no idea were there and these are some of his drawings and so then somebody that he taught this uh nicholas hartsoker got some of these lenses and started looking at other objects and he looked at human sperm and he was shocked to see that in human sperm there are little preformed human beings and that's a, one of his drawings there and you can see the little preformed human beings so all you have to do is feed them so the preformed human beings are created by males and then transferred to females who nurture them along in their uterus until they're born. My point here is that we were often wrong. You know, that is a totally inaccurate description of the whole process of human reproduction, but that's what he thought was going on. And that is the nature of the human mind. We get at least 50% 50, 50 of what we think we know <laughs> is not correct. You know, Mark Twain has that. It's not what we know that causes us problems. It's what we, it's what we know that ain't so. It is the problem. <clears throat> so life evolved in water, and over time it emerged in water. I don't know. I don't think Olga's here, but I need to warn Olga that after the list of amphibians, there's four pictures of snakes, which is interesting. Uh, Olga really responds powerfully, negatively with fear to pictures of snakes, you know, that is, uh, I would say genetic programming um, from we evolved as hunter gatherers in places where there were deadly snakes and we still carry that gene somewhere in us. Well, not all of us are afraid of snakes, but Olga has a powerful reaction. So in this picture, <clears throat> this, is an, this is an insect that lives as a, as a larva in the water and crawls out of the water and cracks open the back of that larva cracks open and out out emerges an air breathing flying insect a dragonfly and it's just somehow life began to adapt to the challenges of life on land and the challenges there's very little water this is a picture of a butt of bumblebees in the meha valley and i put it in to show the astonishing diversity of life in any given place. Who would think there were this many bumblebees in the Manhattan Valley? We do have it, we do have one person, I don't think he's here today, John Colts, who lives in Carlton, who um, <clears throat> has taken on bumblebees as a life study. And he is the bumblebee expert in the Manhattan Valley. And I'm sure it's one of the most rewarding things he does in his day and in his year is, um, document this beautiful life form that nobody knew about until he paid attention to it and i do have that suggestion that we could all take that slight turn in our lives and and become experts in some life form that nobody's paying any attention to 
And when you see them, they have their own tremendous beauty. This is, this is out of E.O. Wilson's book, The Diversity of Life. That book is 20 years old. This is actually out of date. It says animal total species, 1 million. Well, I don't know how out of date that is. That doesn't include plants. And you know the total number doesn't include bacteria. So it may still be fairly accurate 20 years after this chart was created or graphic. But it shows the diversity of life. And I circled here the, 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 the number of organisms, relative number of organisms with backbones, chordates, backbones. So there's mammals are in the smaller slice and the other chordates are in the larger slice, other creatures with backbones. 4,000 mammals are listed. What's interesting here is just how many organisms are that are not closely related to us. And most of them, a large number of them would be insects. And I, I just circled on the lower left, beetles, coleoptera. And that number is out of date. It says a uh, quarter million, 250,000. And there are now, I think, a million beetles, I think, have been identified. So there's a great line from the Annals of Biology in which uh, a preacher asked a very famous biologist in the early 1900s, J.S. Haldane, what he had learned about God from his study of biology. And Haldane famously answered, God has an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> because there's more beetles than anything else in the animal kingdom. So we're actually back to the methow here. In so far as the methow has, lamprey is considered the most ancient fish on the planet. And we have lamprey in the methow. We have decreasing numbers of lamprey because something about the overall environment that lamprey inhabit, and they are anadromous, which means they run to the sea as adults, and then they come back to lay their eggs. So that means they have to go over the nine dams on the Columbia, among other uh, insults. <laughs> so we probably have, I don't know, maybe 5% of the lamprey we used to have. Well, you you know, our, uh, the, the automatic reaction of the human mind is, well, that's a good thing we don't want. They're parasitic, as you can see from this picture. As adults, they're parasitic. So those are sucker mouths. They don't have any jaws, which one is one of the reasons they're considered so primitive. In fact, they, there are fossils of lamprey that are 360 million years old. That would be the initiation of fish on the planet <clears throat> that look exactly like lamprey today. The fossils look like they're exactly the same species. That is far older than any of the rocks in the Methow Valley. So we have life forms that are older than the geology of the Methow. Well, you might think, I, I think that's the last picture of the lamprey. You might think that lamprey are, lamprey have a, you might think that they're just destructive, but they have a place. All living organisms find a place in the ecosystem. I can't fully define the place of um, the parasitic adult form, but I can tell you that in, in this picture, the lower organisms there, the smaller ones are the larval form and they're filter feeders. And we used to find them at river camp on the Chiwak River, when we were canoeing the river, we'd stop and there would be this collection of organic matter in a backwater where it'd just be a mat of conifer needles and decaying vegetation. And if you walk through it, these little larvae would swim out because they're filter feeders. They are uh, transforming decaying, already decaying organic matter. They're filtering that out of the river and turning it into their own food and then and then releasing their what so-called waste, but that waste is gonna be high nitrogen and is gonna enrich the water. So they are beneficial to the aquatic ecosystem as parasites, parasites have a place and they're parasites, I mean, to take a leap here, they're only gonna play on prey on the weaker fish. So those are gonna be the only fish they can catch. They attach the fish, they suck probably blood or hemolymph probably blood out of the fish and then they, they don't kill it i don't think they release it in any case they were an important food source to all the interior native american tribes because there were a lot of lamprey in all of the rivers that are fed by the columbia but they're mostly gone now so this is just life in the methow these are organisms that live in the methow and an interesting point to me is we have we have creatures that are some of the most ancient of their lineage on the planet 
in the mat howl. So lamprey are one of those, this tailed frog is another. Tailed frogs are considered to be the most ancient of frogs on the planet. And their three closest relatives are in New Zealand. Well, how is that possible? How could one frog hop from New Zealand to uh, Washington State? <laughs> and the answer is, of course, all of the land masses were connected. Uh, 300, Pangaea, Pangea, Pangea, I call it Pangaea, were connected 300 million years ago and then split up 200 million years ago. Well, I don't know where New Zealand was in relation to North America, but animals move around and that's why we have one relative here of an ancient life form. Ancient, I put that in quotes because I have to think of Lynn Margulis, famous biologist, her great statement, all life forms on the planet today are equally evolved because life only appeared once and has diversified since then so that all life forms can trace their history back to the first appearance of life 3.8 billion years ago. But some retain older uh, physical structures and, and the tailed frog is one of them. And so that tail is actually a, a copulatory organ because tail frogs, they live in fast mountain streams, really fast mountain streams. And I'll tell you where, if you live here in the Met Howe and you wanna find them, the best place to find tailed frogs, tadpoles, which by the way, have sucker mouths, they are not parasitic. They scrape algae off of river rocks, but they live in fast streams and they have to hold on and they don't have any hands. So they hold on with this sucker mouth. So if you go to Porcupine Creek, which is at Rainy Pass, the other, the other side of the road from uh, Lake Ann and the, and the uh, uh, what do we call that loop? <laughs> um, Maple Pass Loop, the other side of the road. If you go a mile, you come to Porcupine, you have to cross, you have to wait, uh, not wait across, jump on rocks across Porcupine Creek. I think the bridge is washed out. It's full of tailed frogs. That's not quite in the Methow. Cutthroat Creek, that you, pay, you go across Cutthroat Creek on the way up to Cutthroat Pass also has tailed frogs. You just have, you have to turn over cobbles, turn over 10 of them and you'll find a tadpole. So we have these life forms in the Methow. This is another, it's, it's, uh, so it's it's considered a living fossil, one of the most archaic of mammals on the planet. It's called a mountain beaver. The genus is Apollodontia. I say that because sometimes they just refer to them as Apollodontia. They are actually common in the Methow in the in the forest zone of the Methow, but almost no one has seen one. I looked at an article this morning. Uh, I wanted to see why they were considered ancient. They're considered. I have in my notes here. They're a living fossil. I looked at one article and it said, please don't call them a living fossil. <laughs> I got that from somewhere else. So, you know, the biologists are arguing with one another. And I forget what exactly she said, other than the fact it, it's been on the, the, the lineage is 3.8 billion years old. It's equally evolved as Lynn Margulis says. There are some primitive, some older features in this mammal that are not shared with other mammals. It has a primitive jaw. I don't know if that counts for anything. In any case, they are present in the Met Howl. They are not uncommon and almost no one has seen one because they're secretive, they're nocturnal. They live in wet places in the forest, if you can imagine that. It's, it's a little hard to picture wet places in the forest, especially in places that are just little wet springs when you're hiking on the trail and there's a little wet spring crossing the creek. If you look, there'll be holes in the ground next to that spring. Those are the tunnels of mountain beaver. So the point really, the, the, the broader point is here that in a sense, the life forms in the Methow, they bear the history of the evolution of life uh, in the organisms that are still here. This is a human egg. I forget exactly why I put it in. Other, other than the astonishing fact that this one egg contains, assuming it's been fertilized, is, is one cell, is still one cell, contains all the information to create a human being that may live for 90 years, you know, and, to, and it'll create uh, 50 billion, up to 50 billion human cells. All the information is incorporated in that one cell. It begins to, to divide. I looked it up a little bit. It takes, oh, what did it say? I think it said 30 hours after fertilization. It begins to divide and continues to divide until it creates a human being. It's Oh, yes. But even humans carry the history, the evolutionary history of life in their body. 
there is a famous saying, it's not too famous to most of you, the biologists among us have heard it, uh, on, uh, this is a mouthful, it's a mouthful, but I'll explain it, ontogeny, ontogeny, so there's more to it, ontogeny is the development of the individual, ontogeny recapitulates, which means repeats, or reflects, phylogeny, ontogeny recapitulates, ontogeny, uh, phylogeny, the development of the individual recapitulates, it sort of revisits the evolutionary history of that whole evolutionary line of life. They're talking about phyla, but it would be true for all lines of life. What does that mean? This is a human embryo and it has a tail and it has gill slits because ultimately life on land, mammalian vertebrate life on land evolved from fishes and the human embryo will recapitulate, goes back through and experience the, the, the physiological development from early vertebrate history. So at the top, it might be, it's blocked out on mine. I think you can see it. It says, Chucky e. D says, embrace your inner fish. Well, Chucky e. D is Darwin, he's referring to Darwin. This is artwork. It's an art representation of this phenomenon that we carry the evolutionary history of life in our bodies. That's what that's about. And this is a little expansion on that theme. So down at the bottom, I underlined down at the bottom, that first row of the vertical row, the first vertical row is the evolution of fish over three weeks. I think I circled, sorry, what do I need to do here? This, this, this. So I circled the weeks, one week, two weeks, three weeks. The first creature is a fish. So th that's the top picture is a picture of what a fish looks like in its first week of development. And then the second week and then the third week. Well, look horizontally across that first week. Everything looks the same. This at the far right, this is a human, the first week of development, similar to the picture I showed previously. This is a hog. <laughs> they all, they all have gill slits. They all have gill slits and a tail. Because life recapitulates its evolutionary history as it develops. It's just stunning. So this is a Chinook salmon in the Metha River. I actually took this picture a long time ago, probably 20 years ago. This is a female. You can tell it's a female because she's, she knocked all of the scales off of her tail while she was building her nest, the red. That's what they call the nest, a red. She turns on her side and lifts her tail and beats it against the rocks. And she's able to pull up many of those rocks, even some of the rocks in that picture, by the force of the fulcrum force of her tail, it lays her eggs, and then she buries them. And then she buries them. Well, one point here is that... One could consider it a Goldilocks effect or just a biological effect, but life has enriched the actual ecosystem that life exists in over time. What do I mean by that? What I mean in this particular example of salmon, salmon, salmon are born in typically mountain streams. There's not a lot of nutrients in a mountain stream. You're not going to get to be a two and a half foot fish like that in a, in a mountain stream. It, you need to go to the ocean to do that because that's the repository of organic life. That's where ultimately all the organic pot particles wash to. So salmon are born in upland streams. Why? Probably because there's fewer predators in upland streams. That's probably why this behavior evolves. They, they leave... Uh, for the ocean, they swim in the case of the Mad How 500 miles downstream over 90 hours to get to the ocean. They spend two, three years in the ocean and grow, uh, feeding on the richness of that repository of organic life. And then they return and they bring that, the organic matter that they collected in the ocean at where they grew. Gosh, they, what they were something called a June hog, a Chinook. I forget. It was at least four feet. It was just gigantic. Uh, they no longer exist. They, they spawn probably in the actual Columbia itself. But they were bringing the salmon, which still exists, bring back ocean nutrients to the mountain rivers that have been scraped clean by 18 glacial advances over the last two million years and deposit the organic matter from the ocean in the upland mountain streams and enrich those mountain streams. What's going to eat their organic matter? Well, they're going to feed the base of the food chain. They're going to feed the aquatic invertebrates, uh, insects that the, that then the young, the young salmon fry will feed on before they leave for the ocean. So the salmon have tremendously enriched their environment. 
by bringing organic matter back. And that is the nature of life. Life has increased the richness of the planet tremendously over time. There's an interplay. You can't read this. I just wanted to show you there's a lot of fish in the Mount Valley. I think there's 21 on this list. I'm not sure. Uh, I put a red line over here on the left just to highlight the salmonids. Who would think there are so many salmonids? Well, they're not all salmon. The mountain whitefish right here is a salmonid, but not a salmon. And some of them, so now I put a red line over here. This points at the brown trout. Brown trout are native to Northern Europe. A third of the fish on this list are non-native. And that's typical of the, of the planet that we, you know, alien species, because of the activities of humanity, have, we've carried species all over the planet that didn't used to be there. So it's a challenge for ecosystems to adapt to these different alien species. So we have a lot of alien fish in the Methow. Well, how are, how's life going to move on to land? Is there any example of life moving on to land? Yes. There are 32 species of mudskippers, which is a fish. They are fish that spend most of their life on land. They don't have lungs, but they absorb oxygen through the lining of their mouth. They come on to land to reproduce. So they're, they're safer, safer to reproduce on land, especially early on. There was no other life forms on land, certainly no other animals, no predators. They reproduce in the mud at the base, of, uh, you know, at the edge of their aquatic ecosystem and spend more time on land than they do in water. Uh, they can walk on their fins. They don't, have, they don't have legs, they don't have feet, but it's an example of an early evolutionary step for aquatic organisms to move on to land. And that really, that's what amphibians did. As I mentioned, the word amphibian means two lives. They start out their life in water. They have to lay their eggs in water. And the adults typically live on land. The larva lives in the water. This is also an example of the uh, exuberance of natural selection. This I'm circling. I, I think you can probably see the cursor. This is an egg, one egg mass. One female spotted frog will lay 500 eggs at a time every year for probably five years, however long they live. How many of those eggs have to survive to replace the adults? Two. So natural selection is going to pick out which one of those survive. The, the, they're all genetically, they vary slightly. Those best adapted to the environment as it exists at that time. This is Aspen Lake, a picture I took long ago. Uh, Aspen Lake, for one thing, well, it's just the environment, environments vary. Aspen Lake is not even a natural lake, it's dammed up. So they've adapted to this changing environment. And it's, Aspen Lake gets warmer and colder and, and uh, those tadpoles, best adapted to that environment will survive to adulthood. And that's the way natural selection works. It's actually based on death. We don't like death very much, but death is, is woven into the fabric of life. So amphibians, this is another amphibian. And so I guess I'm going to list the amphibians in a moment. And this is a beautiful salamander we have in the Methow that is, I'd say, rarely seen. Long-toed salamander, it lays its eggs in water, as all amphibians do. It hatches into an aquatic larval form that has gills and then metamorphoses into a land animal. Same with our western toads. These are western toads near Black Pine Lake in a pond that's hidden behind the nearest hill, Black Pine Pond. Great place. And this is how they reproduce. They lay these strings of eggs. The male is, it's external fertilization. The male is uh, releasing clouds of sperm that are attracted chemically to the eggs and they're fertilized outside of the male and female. But how much, so speaking of biophilia and love of life, how much do we know about the life forms in the Methow? Well, I'm not criticizing us. I made this list and I cannot, I could not tell you. I think there's maybe seven amphibians. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But would our lives be richer if we knew more about the life forms around us? I think. And the answer, especially if you can interact with those life forms, the answer is definitely yes. And I'll make that point a little later. I also better check my clock. So what are the what are the amphibians on the on the in the Mehau? Long-toed salamander, we saw a picture of that. Tiger salamander, slightly more common than long toed. Some of you have seen that. Tail frog, western toad. We saw a picture of that Pacific, Pacific chorus frog. That's the one that makes all the noise in the spring. Ribbit, 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 spotted frog, and a great basin spadefoot. Most of us don't see spadefoot toads. They live, they they only breed in temporary ponds. When do we have temporary ponds? In the spring. 
And then they go back underground. They live most of the life underground, as do tiger salamanders. They live in uh, gopher tunnels. Oops, sorry. So I don't think Olga's here, but Olga, if you are, you need to turn your screen off for four slides because we're going to look at snakes. Well, how are you going to? We have we have amphibians that have made this uh, evolutionary leap to life on land, but they have to return to the water to lay their eggs. Reptiles are another step of, of life colonizing dry land. The same thing happened with plants, but now we're talking about vertebrate animals. Over time, rept uh, well, reptiles developed an egg that has, I like to call it a Gore-Tex shell. It's a semi-permeable shell. The egg has a living organism inside. It has to breathe. It has to have access to oxygen, but it can't lose. If it dries out, it, it, it's going to die. It's on land, it's not in water. Well, the shell is impermeable to water, but permeable to oxygen. And that allowed this evolutionary line of organisms to colonize dry land. This is a picture I took at Pipestone Canyon just to illustrate, well, mostly because it's such an interesting picture. I found a rattlesnake den with a little help of, from John Rohr. And I'd be surprised if that den is still there because people kill rattlesnakes. They don't like rattlesnakes, but what do rattlesnakes eat? Rattlesnakes eat um, rodents. Rodents are a much bigger threat to humanity than as someone who has tried to store grain a number of times, I can tell you. Rodents are an infinitely bigger threat to humanity than rattlesnakes because rodents, they not only eat grain, if they get into your grain, they just destroy it. They just destroy it. So it's just, you know, that's sort of an ecological fact of life. We don't like rattlesnakes, but they're actually very. So these various reptiles in the Met, how they have to hibernate. They are not warm blooded and they can't maintain their metabolic activity in the winter. So they go underground. So this was a big rock. You can see there's a hole there and there was some kind of cave and they, they spent the winter piled up on top of one another, but they have to then have to warm up in the spring I should have put this picture next, but I mean, the next picture is more snakes, <laughs> but this is a reptile. There's the more snakes I'm trying to go back. So we have this turtle and, uh, you know, you can learn about these creatures. You can find them. We have a lot of turtles in our warm pond. If you find a warm pond, it's going to have turtles in it, in the valley floor. Well, you read about this painted turtle. It is the most common turtle in North America. It extends from here all the way to the East coast. Uh, Lee, do you, have you ever seen a, Painted turtles in the Shenandoah Valley. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. You know. How could you? How could a turtle colonize the whole continent? That's a question to me. They don't walk very fast, but they did. This is on my property here. Every year, I have a gopher, a common, a, car, a garter snake den. There are two species here. There are the ones with the red dots, and there are ones without red dots. They den in a site not very far from the house in the fall. And if I go out there on about April 5th, when on a, sun, a warm day, the first warm day of spring, they will be piled up on top of another outside the den trying to warm up. Uh, it's a great sight. I love it. Olga oh, wouldn't like it, but I like it. So again, this is just about biophilia. All these things we could know about, but we don't tend to know much about. Our lives consume us. And so how many reptiles are there in the Meha watershed? Well, I probably know because I watched... Not only did I put this slideshow together, I watched it five times, but uh, but all these creatures, you know, who have this evolutionary history and these these fascinating lives and are beautiful to look at. Eleven species of reptiles in the Met Howl. you know, none of which can, none of which are active in the winter, so they all have to find a way to adapt to the winter through hibernation. Do we have any other reptiles? Well, you know, birds evolve from reptiles. Birds have reptilian characteristics including scales still on their legs and feet and did it's well established that birds evolved from reptiles in fact there are fossils that are halfway this archaeopteryx which you've heard of very famous fossil found interestingly enough discovered in i think germany in 1861 Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species in 1859, two years earlier, and people said, well, sh there's no intermediate, uh, there's no evidence of any intermediates between reptiles and birds and reptiles and mammals. How is it possible that 
one line of organisms evolved into another. Well, two years later, they found this beautiful fossil of an organism that is intermediate between reptiles and birds. It has feathers on it, but it has reptilian characteristics. It has teeth, birds don't have teeth. It has a tail, birds don't have the bony tails. Birds don't have bony tails, they have tails, feathers. Uh, it's intermediate between a reptile and a bird. And so we got birds. So this, I put this in in part, it's pretty, it's pretty to see our birds, but down at the bottom it's, so that I may, I put this together, I don't know, originally at least 10 years ago it's just 270 birds in the meadow at the bottom i crossed it out with a red line and i put 281 because people are paying more attention to the natural world and so and so we now know there are species that we didn't know were here and i think that's a very promising direction for humans that we are paying more attention to the natural world by the way that bald eagle in the bottom left is stuck in that tree. I was walking on land near here off of my property and the bird was upside down in that pine tree. He's got his foot caught in the crotch of a branch and he was hanging down. He couldn't get up high enough to release it. And so I phoned Kent Woodruff and Kent phoned uh, the smoke jumpers and the smoke jumpers climbed the tree and cut the branch off and the bird flew away. <laughs> It's just, you know, these interactions are so memorable. The bottom right is a great horned owl. I put a wash tub up because geese will nest in wash tubs in the Met Howe and probably elsewhere. And I got the first year I got a great horned owl. I haven't had one since. How do species diversify? Well, this is one example of how they diversify. We have these two almost exactly the same species of uh, golden eyes in the Met Howe. How could we get two species out of one? They, they divide the habitat by season. The Barrow's golden eyes are here in the summer and the Coleman Cum golden eyes are here in the winter. And that is probably actually an artifact of the ice age that it divided. There was probably one species that were pushed apart by this huge glacial mass into the east and the west or the south. And then when the ice melted, they came back together, but they no longer interbreed. And they had, each generation is slightly different. This shows the slight differences over generations these evolved into two different species and they, I don't think they ever interbreed. I'm not sure of that some, some different species will interbreed. Harlequin duck, great creature of the, that we are fortunate to have in the Met Howe. I love this line that I read one time, a Harlequin looks like it was assembled by a committee of first graders. It looks like we had first graders cutting out paper and making a paper mache duck. And this is what we got. <laughs> This is a fascinating creature. It's only here for three months in the summer. It actually is a sea duck. It lives on the rocky coasts in the water on those tumultuous rocky coasts for nine months of the year. Flies up, it doesn't fly overland. It flies up the rivers, up the Columbia, up the Medhow, nests and returns. Uh, offered as a bit of, uh, how birds did not evolve into mammals. <laughs> I almost took this out. It's just that this is a sort of an intermediate creature, this duckbill platypus. We don't have very many in the Met Howl. They're Australian species, but they, they do have some intermediate characteristics. It's a mammal with a bill and webbed feet. It hunts through, a, a, it picks up magnetic fields of its prey in the mud, which are invertebrates and uh, in the water and um, is a fascinating ancient mammal. So this is the evolution. The heart has evolved over time and has gotten more efficient over time. On the left is a fish circulatory system. And the, 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 the point of the picture is in fish, the, oxyg the oxygenated blood is mixed with the deoxygenated blood. Once oxygen circulates through the body, the oxygen is extracted from the blood and used for what? What's the oxygen used for? It's used to break apart the products of photosynthesis, the hydrocarbons, which has the energy of the sun bound up in those chemical bonds. That's what oxygen's for. But fish have a rather inefficient circulatory system. And the point is that even the circulatory system has evolved and improved over time. And so on the right is a mammalian circulatory system in which the deoxygenated blood is kept separate from the oxygenated blood. What's the advantage? What the advantage is you have more oxygen in your blood and you can be more active. You can, you can exercise, you can engage in more metabolism. You can eat more food, break that food down, release the energy of the sun. 
and you can be warm blooded and you can go skiing instead of going high, instead of hibernating. <laughs> We are closing in on the end. I forget exactly where we are. But this is oxygen in the atmosphere over time. And so the, at the bottom left is 4.5 billion years ago. There was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Oxygen, as we like to say, is a very reactive element. Its, it's, uh, it's outer electron shells are not full. It is not a happy camper. It wants to combine with other elements like hydrogen let's make a little water two hydrogens and one oxygen you get water combine two gases and you get a liquid who would think oxygen is reactive it would not exist in the atmosphere except for photosynthesis but it consists it comprises 21 percent of the atmosphere because because plants dominate the planet and plants photosynthesize so plants have changed the the chemistry of the atmosphere the rest of the atmosphere by the way is nitrogen and it would not exist either except in the atmosphere, except for nitrogen, uh, not nitrogen fixing bacteria, but nitrogen releasing bacteria, that they release the nitrogen to the atmosphere. So the whole atmosphere, 99.9% .9 of the atmosphere is made by life. There's this interplay of the physical and the biological. So why do we breathe? Well, I just gave that away. We breathe for oxygen. What's the oxygen used for? It's used to break apart the product of photosynthesis. I can't get it. I just, I probably said that too many times. I just can't get over it. To me, it's so magical. So this is, an, this is, uh, this is one of the last slides. It's a little complicated, but it shows the flow of the, the, the quantity, the density of energy flowing through different aspects of the universe actually, because it starts on the lower left with galaxies. You know, galaxies, it's mostly empty space. There is not much, even though there are billions of stars, there's much more space between stars than there are stars. There's nothing going on. The energy flow in the galaxies is zip. Well, how about stars themselves? Well, the claim here is that, you know, the, 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 <clears throat> the sun is a million times larger than the earth. It looks like the sun must have high energy density. The claim from the physicists is it doesn't, is that it's because it's so huge, the actual density of energy in the sun is low. And the measurement here is something we don't know much about. It's in the middle on the right. Ergs is a measurement of energy. It's like, it could be joules, joules, which I think I've mentioned before. It could be watts. We've all heard of watts, but it isn't. It's ergs. It's a very tiny measure of energy, but it's a measure of energy we can per second per gram. This is a small measurement. But it's, we're showing relative density of energy in different orgasm, uh, organisms, plants, not much, animals. The fascinating thing here is look at the density of energy in human brains. The human brain uses 20% of all of the energy taken in by the human body. It doesn't, it's not 20% of the weight, it's 5% of the weight and uses 20% of the energy. It's, it's, a, it's an emergent property of the universe that energy is being um, condensed over time which is interesting because energy runs downhill if you know the basic rules of it but not in life life is concentrating energy so the question is the last one the, this is humans showing the density the energy density of the brain why is modern society how is it possible that so much energy flows through modern society. Where is that energy coming from? Is it coming through photosynthesis? Well, you're all muted, you can't answer, but the answer is fossil fuels. This is sort of an unnatural level of energy flow, which will certainly come out in the ecology section next week. Although I will not dwell on it because I don't want to depress anybody, but, but the human species consumes a, a gargantuan amount of energy beyond what the biosphere offers because energy has been stored away in fossil fuels. It's an interesting phenomenon. Not necessarily good or bad, it just is. So the evolution of mammals, it just has occurred. <laughs> I don't know what I wanna say about it. Uh, those are characteristics of mammals. It's just the, the third one, well, the third one is homey, homey, uh, homeothermy, constant internal, internal temperature that requires energy density. We are able to acquire a lot of energy and process a lot of energy. So we produce heat and we can stay at 98.6 degrees even if we go outside and it's 10 degrees out. 
we maintain internal body temperature, we can stay active. A lot of organisms cannot stay active. It's an emergent property of the universe. The evolution of mammals, blue whales are mammals and pygmy marmosets are mammals from two ounces to 150 tons. But mammals are recently evolved. I mean, they, they existed on the planet 250 million years ago, but they were, they were like that mouse lemur. And they have evolved, become dominant organisms on the planet over time. I guess uh, these are mammals in the Met house. So we do have this montane shrew in the Met house. I didn't take that picture, but I've seen a few shrews and they are probably the smallest mammals. They have to eat, because they're so small, they have to eat something like 10 times their body weight every day. They just eat. That's all they do is eat all day long because they can't retain the heat. Whereas a moose, I looked it up, but I think the answer was something like 5%. It has to eat five, not 5% 5 of its body weight every day rather than know that the, the shrew has to eat more than 100% of its body weight every day. Anyhow, it's their advantage to being big, but you need more food. So I took that picture at, I was at Roger Lake. I had a botany job there and I was sitting at the edge of the lake and this moose walked out into the willows. And so that's where I saw that. So another minor test here. These are the mammals of the Met How. How much do we know about the mammals of the Met How? Well, I put this together and I, I'm going to bring up the numbers. How many shrews and moles are there in the Met How? I'm going to bring up the numbers. I could not answer these questions, even though I put this together, but it shows there's room for growth. We can be more interested in the life of the Met How that isn't us and our children. <laughs> so there's four species of shrews and moles. I don't think there's any moles. There is a claim for moles down around Libby Creek. I've never seen one. I'll believe it when I see it. Carpe diem, show me the body. <laughs> no, that means she's the day. Uh, I can't remember. What is uh, show me the body is uh, something else in Latin. Bats, well, who would think there are 15 species of bats in the Met How? But the biologists have gone out, you know, people who become interested, like John Colts knows how many bumblebees there are. <laughs> There are bat biologists who go out and find these things out. Rabbits and pikas. We have the one pika. Rodents, 30 species of rodents. None of us could list probably 10 of the rodents. How many species of apes? One species of ape. Carnivores, 18. Hoofed animals, 16. It's just that all these organisms are here. The Methow is an ev is a wor evolutionary workshop. The whole evolutionary story of life is present in the Methow Valley and in the Shenandoah Valley and wherever else you live. I really like this summary statement by Ye Yeats. The world is full of magical things. It's just waiting for human perception to see this magic. Um, I don't know how you get there. I try. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but there's a lot to wake up to. Oh, yeah. So here's all those. And here's, you know, this show. Oh, yeah, there are a few more slides. This is just an example of the beauty of life. So there were seven of these guys came out of that hole. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. Actually, there's eight there. There's eight there. And then they all went back down in the hole. Um, somebody gave me, they found these baby red squirrels on a trail. The, their den had been raided there. And um, I raised them and I took them to camp. And the kids interacted. They are rodents. It wasn't the safest thing in the world just because who knows what but the kids loved them. The kids carried these squirrels around in their pockets. This is biophilia. Whenever you have an opportunity, that means love of life. Whenever you have the opportunity to interact with these animals, these are bluebirds that I trained to push this wheelbarrow uh, uh, in the garden. And then I taught them to compute on my computer. It's amazing the intelligence of these animals over time. This is a cross between a mountain sheep and a homo sapiens. This is river camp last year. This is... I wish I could claim to have thought this up, but I did not. It was Annika and Katie and Morgan probably cooked this up. It comes from things other people have done. They call it a procession of the species. But people, you know, the Native Americans, they didn't do processions of the species, but they would they would take on the ambiance of another organism, try to move into the spirit of another organism. We did that at camp. This girl created this outfit. That's a mop she has on her head with horns, but thought about what it would be like to be a big horn sheep and then had a message for humanity. They stood in a circle. There are a few more here. 
can't see them quite as clearly, obviously a fish in the middle, but this one you have needs an explanation. This is a mosquito. One of the girls, she built, she decided to become a mosquito and the, the mosquitoes had a right to live. So this is the proboscis right here. I don't know what this is. Anyhow, we can grow our love for the biosphere. It's challenging because all organisms eat or their organisms and historically, I'm reading a book right now about the saw, the Kung Saan in the Kalahari Desert. If they find a living organism, they kill it right away. It's food. They're hungry. They're always hungry. That's a dry, austere desert. It's and these are those two of those um, spear points found in East Wenatchee in I forget 1987, 1989. They found a cache of multiple, multiple. These are huge. Look at how big these are. What do you need a spear point that big for? You are not going to kill a grasshopper or a rabbit with spear points that big. They were hunting the megafauna. They were hunting this megafauna, which, which populated all of North America up to 12 to 14,000 years ago. All of these creatures are ex they're not like gone from North America. They're extinct. Why? Because humans ate them, killed them and ate them. That is the... People might some people disagree with that. I think that's probably what happened. Or some of them, like a saber tooth tiger, was dependent on the large herb herbaceous animals and went extinct when their food prey went extinct. It's um, I don't know what that statement about other than we and this is some proof. This is out of E.O. Wilson's book, The Diversity of Life. And this is the rate of extinction on different continents after humans arrived. Well, humans have been evolved in Africa. The rate there was no great extinction event in Africa and that's why this shows a low gradient here because humans co-evolved over 200,000 300,000 even a million years with the wildlife of, of Africa and, and the wildlife knew how to avoid humans to some degree this is the rate of extinction in Australia when humans arrived what was that 35,000 years ago I'm not sure what humans arrived in North America what do we say now? Up to 20,000 years ago. And in Madagascar, the large, the large organisms all went extinct. They just killed them and ate them. And so I think, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think this is a good cartoon. So this little, this little lion is a defendant and his crime is he killed something. And the judge says, you were hungry? Case dismissed. I think it's very funny. But it reflects back on those pictures. The, the native people were hungry. The, the Kung San are hungry. We're hungry. That's why those organisms were killed. It's a natural phenomenon, but it's not working today with 88 billion people on the planet. We need to move into eco, an ecological ethos, ecological understanding, ecological literacy is a nice term. We need to learn to live on the planet without wrecking the place. This is the last slide. It's just... That great quote, time is a river of passing events and swift is its current. So I just put a few images in here. That's granite. The granite has evolved over time. The continents have evolved over time. That's the growth of the continents. That's plants. Plants evolved over time. There were no plants. There were no plants on land. They evolved over time. Animals came out of the ocean. That's a progression of a fish to an amphibian, to a reptile, to... And then, you know, one of the more recently evolved organisms is this Homo sapiens who stands up and says, what's it all about? Well, I say, let's figure it out. At least let's figure it out well enough to be stewards of the planet and not take the toll that we're taking. And it's, as you know, like the cartoon, previous cartoon, it, it, what's occurred is natural, but it, it's an emergent universe it's an emergent planet and i think we can grow into ecological literacy and become stewards of the planet so that was a mouthful hope i didn't overwhelm you <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> now i get going